Great, thank you. Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Bush and I'm a uh, IBM researcher and I'm gonna be speaking to you about our project we've been working on, our open source project, together with Kelly Avisad. And uh, I look forward to uh, presenting and then at the end we'll, we'll have a, a Q&A questions. But our agenda today, we're gonna talk about our, uh, again, our open source project, which is doing tuning of uh, uh, large language models. So part of our agenda, we're gonna just introduce large language models just briefly. And then we're gonna uh, uh, talk about uh, ways you can improve large language models. And uh, uh, there's methods of both prompt engineering, and we have a, a, a session tomorrow, a workshop on how you can do that. Um, there's also Instruct Lab, and I saw that in the, uh, in the uh, area, the common area out there, there's a, a table where you can learn more about Instruct Lab. Um, then we're gonna pass it over to Kelly. She's gonna introduce uh, FMS HF tuning, which is our open source project that helps uh, do model tuning. Um, she's gonna explore different tuning techniques. Um, she's gonna have a before and after demo on her, her brand new, beautiful uh, uh, M3 Mac, so that's gonna be interesting to see. Um, and then I'm gonna take the mic back again. I'm gonna talk about uh, an architectural overview of how uh, we, we have it running on ODH and also on the Red Hat OpenAI. Um, then I'm gonna show a, a demo of it, uh, you know, how you deploy it on a production server. And then we'll, we'll show at the end how it's, how it's deployed and then we'll do cute questions and answers. So just briefly, uh, what are large language models? I mean, there's, they're a, uh, a category of, of AI models and they're very large, large models that are tuned with a bunch of, bunch of data, obviously. Uh, uh, graphics, you know, music, books, you know, all kinds of uh, things are incorporated in these large language models. Um, they're useful for all kinds of applications like chatbots, language, coding, things like that. Um, they're capable of understanding uh, and generating natural language very easily and, and also, of course, graphics and things. Um, there's, you know, multiple different types of models. So th there's the proprietary models you see in uh, the chat GPT that they have, open AIs. Um, the, uh, the, the good thing about that, they, they're very expensive to tune, so, so OpenAI has done that. For us, they're very expensive to create, so OpenAI has done that. Um, the one disadvantage with that is that uh, you're not necessarily sure what they used. So is it, you know, it, because it's not an open model, you know, what data did they include? Is it all legal for you to use in your, in your business? So other companies have been coming out with uh, partially open models give you a little more visibility into what's in the, these large language models. So Meta is an example of their Llama models with that. And then there's fully open uh, large language models, and those are uh, Mistral and IBM Granite models, and there's other ones that, and Hugging Face, there's a whole slew of those. And what's nice about these models is that uh, there's different sizes, and you have a lot of control over, you know, how big of a large language model you want, you know, what it has, whether it has proprietary information or public information in it. Um, so different methods to improve the large language models. So obviously, you know, people spend, you know, months uh, building these large language models, some of the largest ones. Um, very, very uh, expensive to do that. Um, but it's now general purpose. So if you wanted to use that, but it doesn't quite fit your needs, what, what can you do with a, a large language model? Um, one method is the prompt engineering. Um, you can essentially tell the language model, you know, what you're expecting out of it. And if you, you give it a couple of, uh, examples of what you're expecting, then it does a lot better job of, of what, it, what it's supposed to respond with. So I've seen this with uh, coding examples and SQL examples, where if you just ask, you know, give me the SQL for a, for a particular query, it'll give you the, uh, uh, the response. But if, if I give it some, some examples of, um, you know, good examples of what I expect it to come up with, um, then when you give it the query, it, and, and it, it knows your table names, it, it knows your database, it's, it's much better at, at responding with what you expect and the coding example is a much, much, usable, or much more usable uh, a result. Um, the same thing with RAG, essentially a retrieval augmented generation. Um, instead of putting this in the prompt or in the context, you can actually have uh, the model utilize your own uh, data source. So the data source can be a file, it could be a PDF, a PowerPoint. Um, we, we have, again, our, our prompt engineering lab uh, tomorrow will be using RAG as part of the examples on that. But essentially what you can do is, is link it to like your user manual, manual or you can link it to you know, a database of you know, frequently asked questions or maybe it's the hours of your business or something that the large language model would have no idea. Maybe it's not current, you know, was compiled uh, you know, 
four or five months ago, but you can now give uh, with the RAG data something that's current, that's accurate, that it, that it can use. And as it does the, the analysis, it'll use the RAG first, essentially, before it uses a large language model. Um, and then we have the, the fine tuning. So the, the first, first two items I mentioned here, they don't change the model. The model is, is, is there and um, you, 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 you'll get the result, but the, the, the end, the, the large language model stays the same. Um, with the fine tuning, you're actually able, capable to end up you know, generating a new language model that you could, large language model that you could use later for your, for your business for, for um, you know, other queries. So with fine tuning, you can customize the style and tone. You can specialize the model and make it more efficient. And you can add uh, extensive domain knowledge. Um, another option, again, we, we talked about it. It's, it's in the, uh, in the uh, um, lobby there is in StructLab. And this is another method where if you have open source models, you can actually uh, use InstructLab to um, add your data, add, add your you know, skills or, or the, the information you want the model to have. Um, you, you work with the Instruct Lab tools, uh, make your change, push a PR, your PR gets merged, and then you end up in, in, the, uh, in the open source domain with a large language model that everybody can use. So it's, it's not just you you're benefiting from the large language model, but you can now you know, share this knowledge with everybody. So it's a way to essentially give back to the large language model community and the Hugging Face community. Okay, now I'm gonna pass off to Kelly. She's gonna talk about uh, FMS tuning. All right, so now we want to fine tune a model of all these different methods we've decided. In this case, we're gonna talk about fine tuning the model, creating a new large language model. Um, how do we do this today? You know, one of the most common ways is to go to Hugging Face and use the Hugging Face Python libraries to do that, which is a perfectly great way to do it. Um, the limitation that you know we found ourselves in as a you know in our organization was well we have a lot of users who want to fine tune models um, and they don't all want to write code to do it some they just want to um, take their data run something and just fine tune the model and not have to worry about learning all the python libraries and everything how to actually code it up they just want to run it um, we, so we want it to run, we want it to run in a robust way. If it fails in the middle of tuning, how do we deal with that? Um, how do we deal with, with, if we've got a, a bunch of users kind of um, all wanting to fine tune, how do we queue up those requests? Um, how do we make it self-service so that users can run those tuning requests themselves? And again, without writing code to do it. Um, so that's what uh, I'll talk about here with our library that we've written in, in order to enable these kinds of scenarios. Um, yeah, so we've got this foundation model services. It's kind of a weird acronym, but uh, it's out there on GitHub. Where there's a link uh, at the bottom, which is basically, um, it's essentially a wrapper around the uh, Hugging Face SFT trainer library, which is you know, what you would use to fine tune a model. It uses PyTorch FSDP for um, distributed training. So if you want to train across multiple GPUs, how does it shard the data, train across the multiple GPUs, and bring everything back together? So we're basically taking a lot of these open source existing libraries and kind of stitching them together into a script that you can just run, and your users can run. Um, so again, we can just kind of let, launch it with command line um, and the, the type of, um, there's multiple methods of um, fine tuning. Um, at the moment, we're supporting full fine tuning um, and then two kinds of parameter efficient um, fine tuning called prompt tuning and LoRa. And we'll get into that in the next slide. So what, what, is, what are these different methods of fine tuning? Um, so you've got full fine tuning, which um, is the use case where you take an existing large language model and you modify the model itself. So you come in with model A, you run your fine tuning, it adjusts the weights of the existing model, and out of the other end you get a brand new model or a modified version, but it's, it's a different model. Um, that is going to be the most resource intensive kind of fine tuning. Um, because that does take a lot of memory and GPU and resources to do, there are more efficient ways of running fine tuning and 
your, you know, um, and depending on your use case, it could be inferior results or it could be the same as fi uh, full fine tuning. Um, one of those um, PEFT for short would be um, LoRa, which is um, yeah, which is essentially um, you are adjusting model weights, but instead of creating a brand new model, you're what you're putting on top what they call an adapter layer, which is a little layer that sits in f on top of the model. So you still have model A. You didn't you don't have model A, but you have model A plus another layer on top, so that when you're doing inferencing against this um, against the model, it's it's both the the, the original base model plus the adapter layer are, are being used during inferencing. Um, and another method of parameter efficient fine tuning is prompt tuning, um, which in which case you're not modifying any model weights, you still have your base model. What it's basically doing is kind of like prompt engineering where you're kind of giving it data, you're giving it prompts, um, it will, um, so you can provide it that data. So what it does is it kind of creates another layer of that it puts into your context, um, which is basically a prompt, except it's not English. It's kind of gibberish <laughs> to our eyes, but to the machine, it understands the instructions and then it, it can use that when you're inferencing against the model. Um, so the example that I'll give in the next slide is we're gonna, we're gonna go through full fine tuning and I'll give you an example of how you would do that um, using this library. Um, so the demo I'll show, this is basically how you would launch it. Um, again, I'm gonna show you how you would launch it in the command line, which is just a Python script. And then Jim, after um, this demo is finished, he'll show you how, that, how you could deploy that into OpenShift. Because first we gotta start with the command line, and then we can talk about how we'll integrate that into actually deploying this in like a Kubernetes environment and so forth. So basically that's all it is, right? It's a Python script, sfttrainer.py. This is in the open source Git, um, Git repo, you can see it. Um, and you basically feed it a bunch of parameters. So you're gonna give it the base model that you um, want, so you can download it straight from Hugging Face, it can pull it from Hugging Face. Um, give it some JSON data, tell it where to put the output, and a couple of parameters. Um, so that, that's basically how you kick it off. So a little demo um, of you know, what fine tuning would kind of look like before and after. So um, let's say, uh, so one of the use cases for fine tuning would be something along the lines of sentiment classification. So if I have um, a blob of text, I might wanna say, hey, what, is this a positive, is this negative, is it kind of neutral? Um, and just as a little example, I've got um, text generation UI running on my laptop. So I'm gonna load Tiny Llama, which is a one billion parameter model. So a relatively small large language model as opposed to GPT-4, which we've got tens of billions and trillions. Um, so that's gonna be, and I can run this actually on my laptop because it's small enough. Um, and on my silicone, Apple silicone. So I'm going to give it some text. So for example, um, I've got some pre-curated um, uh, Yelp reviews about local restaurants. So I'm going to ask it um, on a scale of one to five with one being the most negative and five being the most positive, rate the sentiment of this text, or this, the following review. And I'm gonna paste that here. And again, this is the base tiny llama model. And so it actually does a okay job, but it gives me a lot of text. <laughs> and if I run it again, it might give me a different answer as do large language models often do. So if I actually run it again, it could actually give me a different response. Um, 
but it's kind of giving me a lot of text. It's not a terrible answer, but it's not exactly what I'm looking for. Um, so what I might want to do is, all right, let me find some data set that will kind of instruct it better on how to answer my question. So um, if you go one just example, you go to um, Hugging Face, go to data sets. I found one data set that's about Yelp reviews for sentiment analysis. So it takes a Yelp review and then it gives it a one to five rating. So this is a CSV file. I'm going to convert, you know, and then I'm going to feed that into my training data. Um, not to bore you, but <laughs> I'll have to uh, convert the CSV to JSON before we run it. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of what it would need to look like. Um, it, on our, um, the, uh, the GitHub repo, we've got some example Python that you can just take the CSV, convert it to a JSON format that the trainer would understand, and then we're off and running. And then all I've got to do is execute this on here. I'm not, I don't want to run tuning on my laptop right now, but as we sh showed before, that's what the Python script would look like. And um, yeah, so that, that, that's kind of just what you would do. You would feed this in, JSON data, and end up with a new model. So then I'll show you what it would look like after we tune the model. Um, so in true cooking show style, I've got Tiny Llama sentiment loaded up here. So I'm going to load that one that this is the model that I trained earlier because that will typically take hours to run full fine tuning, so we don't have time for that right now. Um, so I'm gonna load that one up. Okay, and I'm gonna go back here, do a new chat, and actually I'm going to take the same prompt and paste it here. And five. <laughs> so what we've seen here is that it just knows what I'm looking for. I've shown it enough examples in the training data that it knows how to reply to me. Um, and just as a few, few more fun examples, here's some more, uh, here's some more Yelp reviews. So I'll do that. And at this point, I'm not even going to prompt it. I'm just going to paste the text in, and it's going to be a two. And that's because I've given it enough examples that it has learned what kind of response I want. So all I have to do is type in some text, and it's going to give me a number, because that's what the training data has trained it to do. Um, OK. And I'll kick it back over to Jim. Thank you. OK, so now you saw the, the CLI uh, method of that. but. The, the way you prototype it, if you wanted to put it out in uh, Red Hat OpenShift, is uh, you take you know these open source projects that, that we that we're covering here. Um, the upstream projects you see there's a whole list you know Ray, Codeflare, Model Mesh. You got a little FMSHF tuning uh, there, Kubeflow, PyTorch, TensorFlow, etc. But what Red Hat's done is they've you know, merged this into the ODH, the, the community project, and this is Red Hat's uh, open source. Um, I'm not sure what the right, right name would be for it, but essentially it's where they put everything uh, for Red Hat before they put it in their product for, from, the, from the AI perspective. So uh, you can run it for free on, on ODH and test it, and, and so I've run that many times on our, on our servers. But uh, then the productized version is the Red Hat o, uh, OpenShift AI, and that's where you get the support behind it. Um, and... Uh, I'm going to show you a demo of it, so how you actually deploy it. So this is the, uh, the Red Hat OEI uh, 211 that's out um, now, um, and it's just six pr pretty easy uh, steps. One is you install the, the prerequisite, the service mesh operator, and you install the Red Hat o OpenShift AI operator. You wait for the, the, uh, uh, the integration to succeed, and then you can deploy the D DSC, the data center uh, um, cluster, and then uh, uh, configure your queue components and then deploy a sample PyTorch job. So I'm going to skip out of here if I can. Or maybe I'm out of it already. 
Okay, and we have our demo. So essentially, if anyone's seen the OpenShift console, this is the, the OpenShift console for uh, uh, my cluster, an OpenShift cluster. And what I'm doing is installing the first item, the service mesh, and I'm taking all the defaults for this. Um, I'm gonna pause just really briefly here. I wanna make one point is, uh, you see this update approval on, on the bottom here? There's automatic and manual. So when I'm doing testing and I'm just messing around, I'll, I'll leave it on automatic. You know, a lot of times my clusters, they don't live very long. So I don't worry about, about this, I just let it go. And so automatic, what this means is when Red Hat comes out with a new operator or any of these operators come out uh, with a new version, it's gonna just automatically update it. So overnight or whenever that update's pushed, it's, it's gonna get pushed over to my cluster. So th that may in production be a good or bad thing. So usually in production, I will keep it as manual because um, you don't want surprises, especially overnight around weekends occurring in your production servers. So just something to keep in mind. But for testing, uh, uh, automatic is, is an easy way to go. And so we're installing the service mesh operator. Um, this is a little bit of a cheat in that this cluster that I installed it on, it, uh, oh, and we're doing now the Red Hat uh, OpenShift AI uh, thing as well. It has the same uh, uh, install method with automatic and manual. So again, in production, I'd leave it to manual. But, so I'm installing these, and again, the, the cheat is that the, these images have already been pulled. So it, this is faster than you'd see on a brand new cluster. But obviously, if, you, if, if you've run this several times on a cluster, then the images coming from uh, Quay are, are very fast. So we've got the uh, service mesh is already installed. We've got the uh, Red Hat uh, OpenShift AI coming down, and it should be pretty fast. Okay, it's succeeded. And then we can see we're supposed to have a data science cluster. It's warning us that we need to have one of those. But first, I just make sure that the initialization is complete. Um, and the only time I've seen where the initialization, the DSC uh, installation is a problem is if you forget the service mesh operator. It'll sit there, just, it'll, it'll say that it's, it's, I think it's installing mode. Um, and it, it will never go to ready. But I make sure it's ready. Then I create the uh, data science cluster. And then one catch on this, I'm gonna pause it briefly is, get off that, one, one catch with, so this is the, the default DSC that comes with uh, the, the Red Hat OAI, but one thing is missing, I gotta scroll down a little bit, I think, yeah. Uh, you, stop it there. You, you'll see that the, uh, the training operator is removed, and it removed the thing. I'm, I'm hoping that the next re release of uh, Red Hat OAI It'll be there already, but if it's not, um, you know, it's removed, but we can change it to managed. So essentially for our project, our open source project, we really only need two, two items here. We need to have Q, and, and that is in the managed state. And then we need to have this uh, training operator, which is removed, but we're, we're changing to uh, managed. So the, the DSC will install it. So we change the managed, say create, and then it launches the DSC. And this is pretty fast. Again, if you, you have the images already pulled, it's, it's faster. But uh, these uh, products get deployed. So I'm gonna skip over to the command line so we can take a look at um, these things getting created. And it, it, the state is progressing. It actually is faster on the status than it is actually on the, on the images, but we'll see that in a moment here. Okay, it's ready. So we'll go over to command line and take a look. And you can see that, um, I'm gonna do a watch on it, so, so it's a live update. But you can see that you know, pods are still coming up. They're not, not all of them are ready yet. But again, the only ones that, that, again, for this particular project that we were watching and care for are the Kubeflow training operator. It's still not quite in the ready state, but almost there. And then the Q controller. And uh, the Q controller is ready. And now I see the Kubeflow training operator is ready. So now we can go with an example. Um, and so the example we can deploy, it's, it's a, essentially a YAML file or you can uh, copy and paste uh, with uh, cat. Um, let me pause it really quick. Oh, I'm sorry, one, one last step before we, we deploy the PyTorch job. We have to tell Q about our resources. So Q has uh, items like workload priority classes um, it has you know cluster queues and flavors and local queues. Essentially, this is when when you have a, a large cluster with a lot of users, 
this is a method that you could classify you know, d different jobs. So you have some that are higher priority or lesser priority, um, things that go to, to bigger queues or, or, or smaller queues. So we have to have at least a couple queues created. So we created these uh, uh, queue, you know, queue uh, uh, items. And now in the PyTorch job, we can actually uh, uh, send the, the YAML file, you know, which, which queues you want it to go to, you know, how many CPUs, how much memory and stuff. So th this is a quick PyTorch job that's running. So you can see the PyTorch job is on the top. The pod that it's running is, is and this is a, a, a prompt tuning that it's doing. But this is a live uh, prompt tuning. It's, it's a pretty small one, just with a couple Twitter examples. But in about 60 or 70 seconds, it goes to complete. So this, this succeeded here. And works here and then this is a kind of a, a view of the PyTorch job so the top was cut off I, I couldn't have everything in here the top of it Kelly showed was the the configuration like what model it, it's supposed to use and and the different parameters it's supposed to use for the for the tuning but then underneath that you have the PyTorch uh, uh, CR and this is where you define you know, how many CPUs or GPUs you want to use you know what the container names should be what image should be uh, if you're going to write output or, or get input, you know, what, what volumes you're going to use. And then here's an example of it succeeding at the bottom. And it's very easily repeatable. If you have the YAML file, you can run this, you know, as many times as you want. Okay, this is the end. Oh, thank you. Yeah, this is the end of our uh, presentation. So uh, open for questions if you get, anyone has questions. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Um, per se, we are not on production, but we did enable the auto updates on. Mm -hmm. Is there any easy way to turn it off? We got burned this morning. Yeah, yeah probably goodbye the speaker here. I, that's a, a good question. I believe the answer is yes. I, I don't know if I've done it, actually, but I, I think the answer is yes. You can go in and change it. But if you want, I could follow up. I could create a cluster and test that for you. But yeah, but, but I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. So the one catch when you're, you're doing this in dev, the, the, the one thing why people like to have it in automated mode is that uh, it gets to be kind of a pain. It is, it's good for production not to have it auto-update, auto especially when you're not expecting it. Um, I've seen things break sometimes, unintended breakage, but uh, it is kind of a pain to always go and, and update it manually you know, whenever those happen. And, and this is only just a, a couple of operators, but I've seen some production servers where they have many operators and, and you have all these updates you have to do manually. But uh, from a production system, it's a good idea to still do it manually. Yes, way in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about fine tuning and the size of the data set that you have used. So I just wonder if there is any rule of thumb to for the size of the data set that is required for the effective fine tuning to take place. Like, is there any rule for that? Yeah, so um, the size of the data set for that demo, I took it straight out of, um, uh, Hugging Face open source, and the file was like 700,000 examples. So it was a pretty large example. Um, I did run it on a subset using like 200. There was an obvious difference between accuracy between the two of them. Um, I am not a data scientist, but um, from what it, it, there is not, as far as I know, a hard and fast rule. Um, it, it's kind of like a try and see kind of a thing. I would say with probably, I probably didn't need 700,000 examples, um, but I definitely needed more than 200. Um, so it's usually one of those things where you try, you know, for example, my 200 example file, it took, I was able to run it on my laptop on my M3 chip for, and it took like four hours. Um, 
the one with 700,000 examples took, I ran on a cluster with two A100 GPUs for 12 hours and it hadn't finished. Um, or it, it got through one epoch, only one. So, and that's the one that I showed because all I needed was a one epoch actually because I had so many examples. So, um, you know, it's, it's really just a, a trial and error kind of thing, yeah. Um, so at the start, you mentioned that um, this creates like a, or like there are different ways to fine tune a model and versus like creating a new model with different weights. Where do you draw the line between like fine tuned enough to be like different and like a whole new model? Fine tuned enough to be different and a whole new model. You know, it depends on your use case. Um, so, you know, usually you want to start with the cheapest thing and the easiest thing. So you would, you know, you might want to start with prompt engineering and seeing if you, but you know, but if you're, if you're going to prompt engineer something and get the right, um, get the right response out of it, usually it's got to be a really giant model, like a, you know, like tens of billions of prompt, then that's going to be expensive to inference. So the question is, do you need like, um, do you need a big model, general purpose model? And then um, if so, because do you have like hundreds of different use cases and everyone's going to hit this thing and use it, so you kind of need a big model, right? So then maybe you can just get away with just prompt engineering it, right? But then maybe your use case is that actually we have this one silly, not silly use case, but we have this one very specific use case that we have. Um, and we don't, maybe we just need to take a one billion parameter model and then fine tune it to our use case and get this new model and it's small, but it does exactly what we needed to do, like spit out a number for us when we give it some text. So, you know, it, it, it's a lot of factors that you have to weigh. Um, you know, how many use cases do you have? Can you, is it cheaper to run a big model or is it cheaper to run a, tune a small model? Um, yeah, it's, it's really a lot of experimentation. <laughs> yeah. Is that helpful or? Um, so when concerning so 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 we have gen, so we have pre-trained models uh, that people use every day and then we have um and then we have untrained models like uh like the large language models that you were showing us now right so what would you say is the um best method yeah what would you say is how how would you say the best method to uh, train uh would differ when uh comparing pre-trained models like ChatGPT and uh comparing um large language models yeah, and comparing large language models, do you think um, is is there is there a better way to uh, train each of them, like for rag, like uh, for rag for untrained models and whatnot? Or so, are you asking? Um, is there a, a way to a better way to find to train a a large language model like GPT four versus something else? Is that what you're? Uh, yes, yes, is there a better way to train, uh, is, is there a better way to, um, a better way to improve a pre-trained model with, with respect to, um, with respect to an untrained model that, or, or a comparatively untrained model, like, like a large language, um, model that you were showing? Just yeah, now. I think, again, it's probably, um, you have to have a specific use case in mind, right? Like, sure. um, and then really you can just kind of see, well, compare and contrast how does one perform over the other. Um, yeah, and, and it's kind of, not, not to be a cop-out, but <laughs> kind of like you have to experiment and see. Um, it, it depends on the use case, I guess, yeah. Okay, right. uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly and James, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.